Welcome to this episode of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Our special guest this week is Joel Rosenberg. Hey, Joel, would you like to introduce yourself to our watchers and listeners? Sure. Uh, my name is Joel. I'm on the special projects team at Rewiring America. Um, we're a nonprofit. We're trying to get everybody to electrify everything as a path to getting off of fossil fuels. Um, and that's I'm here to share some of the stuff, particularly that's useful for renters, but that can also be useful for homeowners and everyone in general. There are obviously uh, homeowner versions of the stuff I'm going to talk about, but I figured focusing on renters is they, they don't often get enough love and I'm one of them. Yeah, that's fabulous. It's really great. I completely endorse this agenda to electrify everything. I think we can accomplish a lot of our goals simply by that um, one trend. So um, I'd like to hear what you have. So what's what's tool number one, Joel? Okay, so tool number one is this, uh, it's called a, a portable air conditioner with heat. It's essentially a heat pump that uh, like the window units that you often see for air conditioners, some people might be less familiar with these sort of roll around ones that that uh, have a thing that just sits in the window so it doesn't have to have the window completely open. Um, but it's actually a heat pump. So, so it works in both the summer and the winter. Uh, I could turn it on. So be this before, particular... before you start, let me just describe sure. what it is that um, you sure. have. So you have this um, unit that is about, uh, you know, waist high um, off the ground, and it's kind of a black, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, maybe a foot wide and a foot and a half, or a foot deep and a foot and a half wide or so. And I don't know, it's like, it's like some really big luggage. It's like a big piece of a kind of rolling luggage about that size. And um, so this is a heat pump, which means it's kind of like it's, it works both to cool things and to heat things, but it doesn't burn gas or coal or oil it uses correct it that's exactly right it, it is that's a, a luggage size is a pretty good description right, right and it also has this uh hose that comes off the back and this hose actually has two hoses inside of it even though it's just a single hose okay. in this version they combined both of them and uh, a little uh plate that would mount into the window okay I so this is a, a window. So hose is you know it's about the size of your waist it's a huge hose and it's sort of like you i guess you roll the the luggage up in front of the window and you open up the window partially or you have some kind of opening and then this plate and the and the hose go in so you don't actually have to mount it into the uh, window it's mounted in front of the window i guess right yeah but totally it's inside. it's inside it's not outside yeah the luggage sits inside and uh there's just the hose goes to the window that's the only you only have to open your window maybe a foot instead of like you know a foot and a half two feet and you don't have a big thing hanging through your window uh, the whole unit is sitting inside of your room and only the air is being exchanged with the outside. That's very, very clever. Very clever. And so the thing about heat pumps, and I'm sure you'll explain it, is that it uses electricity, but it's not using electricity to heat it. It's not like it's not like your normal electric heater, which is uses a lot of electricity and can be very expensive because it's generating the heat from the electricity. But here the heat is just using to pump the heat from the outside to your inside. Yeah. The way we sometimes describe it is like your refrigerator is a heat pump in that it pumps heat out of the refrigerator and into your kitchen. Uh, and your window air conditioner is also a heat pump, except it only works in one direction, pumping heat out of your room and to the outside. And the only real difference for a heat pump is that it's an air conditioner that can switch directions right. and also pump heat from outside into your house to make it warmer. Right. So if you've ever felt the back of your fridge and felt it be warm, or if you ever walk past an air conditioner uh, while it's running, you'll feel that it's warm on the outside. Uh, this basically just puts that part inside to heat your room uh, in the winter. And it's a little counterintuitive because, um, because there's heat in even very cold air. I mean, uh, we, it, it, if you think about it in terms of uh, absolute temperature, which maybe mm -hmm. you learned in high school, where absolute zero is two, minus 273 degrees Celsius, um, this is uh, pumping heat out even of freezing cold air and into your room. And um, I'll just talk a little bit about this particular model, which um, which is nice because it's it's called inverter driven, which basically means it's variable capacity. So instead of being on or off, it can adjust in, in between. It can be 30%, 50%, depending on how much heat it needs to or cooling it needs. Um, 
it's pretty quiet. So I just turned it on and, and hopefully, you know, oh, my, my partner, she uses this. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, and uh, it's not working properly because it's not mounted in the window because I didn't want to be backlit, but uh, we've been using it all winter and it's great. The use case that we have is we're renters. We have central uh, fossil gas heat, but my partner likes it really warm. So we have kept it in her room to warm up just that room. I don't mind it being, you know, 67, 68. So we'll not turn on the central heat. We'll just heat that room and we just reduce our fossil fuel use. That's a use that could be for a homeowner also. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, so, so I guess that would be one of the questions. You can understand if you had an air conditioner, it could certainly cool a room, a, a window mounted version, and maybe even a couple of rooms if you were so lucky to have it lined up. Um, is, is, is this a, a similar um capacity and also is it kind of like a similar expense to cooling a room as heating the room uh i think that well i think i'm not sure about the expense we've had it since november okay uh this one i think they say it can do up to 550 600 square feet um the I, reviews online have said that it's done even more in an open space you know in a, a sort of open floor plan type situation right. um it doesn't really heat in our house beyond that one room, but that's been fine, mostly so we can keep the heat off, uh, the central heat. Right, right, right. Okay, and um, uh, and it's a 110? Uh, yeah, it plugs into a regular 110 outlet, and uh, it, co it costs like, a, I think, around a quarter an hour, probably a little less okay. uh, to run. So, you know, it's and, and, a couple and, bucks a day. What is What is the name of it and how much does it cost? Sure. The name is the Medea Duo uh, Inverter Driven Heat Pump. I got it for seven hundred bucks. Uh -huh. um, uh, and there's there are other ones online. One of the benefits of this one is that when it is in heating mode, it does condense a, uh, moisture out of the air. And so there's a pump inside. So all the water collects on the bottom. This particular version uh, has a pump that will. I hooked up this. Uh, angle this down here i hooked up this uh, hose uh-huh and then i just have it emptying into this tub truck bucket here and this collects the water inside the house okay but if if it didn't have that internal pump then i would have to manually drain it every you know day or two right it doesn't fill up a ton but um there was a webinar that you can find online if you search youtube for in uh portable heat pumps you can find a, a short webinar that talks about the benefits of different versions of these kinds of um, portable heat pumps. Okay. Um, and and is it a true heat pump in the sense that you can also use it to cool in the summer? Yeah. And again, that's the use case is we've been heating my partner's room for the winter, and then she likes it hot in the summer, so I'll move it into the into this room and cool it down so we don't have to run the central air conditioner as much. That's really great. Yeah, that's really cool. Or hot or warm. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so $700, you can have this sort of portable room, um, heat pump that heats or cools it. That's, that's really fabulous. That's, that's really fantastic. So are there many models, uh, 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 and this is, um, one of many and you kind of make your choice or is this, or are there are only a few. And if there are many models, are there some that are better than others? So tell me about that. Sure. So uh, there are an increasing number of air conditioners with heat, they're calling it, because people don't really know what heat pumps are when it comes to like window units and portable units. Um, but the market is growing because more and more people are interested in electrifying. Um, and, you know, again, I picked this from that webinar where they compared what's available now. But but as more come to market, I'm sure they're going to get even better than this. Uh, I guess my main message would be you know, as we come into cooling season and people rush to buy air conditioners, uh, stop and look around and get a heat pump or a quote unquote air conditioner with heat, and then you can use it all year. Right. So try not to buy an air conditioner this year if you're in the market, right. buy something that can also be useful uh, in the winter. That's really great. So, so I wonder if the um, Korean appliance makers are kind of getting into this, um, you know, LG and, and all those. Yeah, I mean, Medea is a Chinese company, but they bought Toshiba's home appliance line. So this is essentially a Toshiba uh, model that has been rebranded as Medea. Okay, that's great. 
Well, that's fabulous. I mean, right now the technology of air conditioning is pretty well established and and if they're just basically running it in reverse, you would think that this should be a pretty dependable appliance. You would hope. Yeah, I, I, we'll see about the durability. You know, I think that like window units in general and portable units in general, you know, I don't know what the lifespan is expected to be, but uh, it's given us no real problems. When we first got when we got the first unit, uh, there was a problem with the uh, with the water pump mm. and I just returned it and got another one. And it's been totally reliable ever since. And I know a couple other people who have them and also have had no problems. That's really great. Fantastic choice. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Joe, what's your second tool? Okay, turn this off. Second tool, uh, so is this here, um, induction burner. Okay. So this thing you can buy for a little over $100. Um, you know, there's you, this, can you describe it? Um, sure. You're holding it's, up. It's, about, it's probably like one foot by one and a third feet, feet um, by three inches tall. Uh, it's got a flat surface on top where you put pots and pans just like you would on any cooktop. Uh, and then you, you know, it's got a little control panel in front where you can turn it on and adjust the uh, settings pretty easily. And, you know, the, the beauty of induction burners compared to what you usually think of as an electric resistance stove, which might be those coils that, uh, you know, you find in lots of homes from, you know, back in the day, 50s, 60s, et cetera, uh, is that this is using an, an electromagnet to transfer energy to the cookware uh, through electromagnetic induction. So it's not really heating up the surface. It's just transferring the energy magnetically to the pots and pans. So uh, some people, so you might've heard about the gas stove controversy that happened you know, last month around whether ga burning ga fossil gas or natural gas in your kitchen gives you your kids asthma. Um, People are concerned about that. Unfortunately, uh, stoves in general are not required to be vented to the outside, which is, uh, you know, if you have a fossil gas furnace or a water heater, those are required by law to be vented outside. But, you know, fossil gas stoves or stoves in general are not required to be vented. And so if you have a hood above your stove, uh, it doesn't necessarily go outside. Or if you have a microwave with a fan, mm -hmm. it also doesn't necessarily go outside. You should use your ventilation if you have it whenever you're cooking, because it also produces particulates. But burning fossil gas in your house is not great. Um, and so with induction, you can switch, and it's much it's much more easily controlled. It's more like computer-controlled cooking than those old burners, the coil burners that people didn't like because they were hard to control. So how is the uh, response rate on the induction? I mean, that's uh, you see, there's two different kinds of controls, like being able to maintain a particular... Uh, temperature, but there's also the speed of response. And that's one of the things that was people didn't like about the, um, the electric coil ones was they were kind of very slow to, to respond to a change. How is the induction response? Yeah, inspection, induction response is great. I mean, like I said, it's basically like computer controlled cooking. So this one has 20 settings from like half to, you know, in half right, right. increments up from zero to 10. And so when you dial it down, it, it basically just reduces the amount of energy being transferred to the dish. And so I've watched as it goes from boiling to simmer, basically in the amount of time that it takes for the, you know, the liquid or whatever I'm cooking to itself cool down. But the energy transfer is instant, much like gas. Um, and you, it does take a little bit of adjusting. Um, in general, this thing comes on at around, it comes on at five, this particular model mm -hmm. is a duck's top uh, uh, I forgot the model number, but it's a duck's top. Uh, it's again, I guess, I think it's a Chinese one, but it, it I, I found it because I used to live in Berkeley, California, and the Berkeley uh, Tool Lending Library mm. was lending these out. And I was like, well, if it's robust enough for them, it'll be robust enough for me. And what's it called again? It's called a what? Duck top? Duck's top is the name of the brand, D U X T O P. Okay. Uh, but there are lots of different versions sure. out there. Sure. And about how much would one of those cost? Yeah, this thing right now is around 110 bucks, uh -huh. somewhere between, it fluctuates, I think, between 100 and 120. And do you, um, the only do you okay. use it like uh, in a, as a adjacent to your stove, or do you not have a stove at all, or do you also have a stove built in version of the induction coil on your stove? Yeah, so we, we're renters and we have oh, a yeah. fossil gas stove, so a regular gas stove, and we just put this directly on top of the burner. 
uh, and cook with it almost exclusively. And we've done that for over a year. So um, we hardly use the gas at all. And when we do, my partner's like, how come it's heating up so slowly? And it's because <laughs> uh, she's so used to induction now. Right. And so whether you, you know, you can buy them, you know, in regular sure. installation, full ranges, just a cooktop. Um, but this is a great stopgap solution. And even after, if you were, you know, a homeowner and you replaced your stove with an induction uh, or, you know, just yeah, yeah. if you go electric with your installed range, you can still keep this around and have an extra burner if you need it. Yeah, sure. Or you could take it, you know, to a friend's house and show it off yeah. there or Etc. Yeah. Well, so another what, another advantage of the induction is that you have a, a uniform uh, surface without any dents or crevices or gaps, so it's very easy to clean. Um, unlike almost any other range. Totally. People like that, and um, you know, once you get used to it, it's it's great, and uh, it's you know, chef professional chefs are coming around on this also because yeah. it keeps the kitchen a lot cooler. It's safer if you have kids because the surface isn't really heating up. Sure. It's just transferring it to the pan. It stays a little warm after, but it's not very dangerous. So not the, only, like fire. the only other issue is, is making sure you have the right pots. Yeah. So that that's the last thing is um, if you have a magnet, I have a magnet here. If a magnet sticks to your pot or pan, it'll work. Uh, we uh, had to buy this new pan, this new sort of saucepan, um, paid about a hundred bucks for that, but you could have gotten it cheaper. This was our previous main saucepan, and this one is non-magnetic. Even if the magnet doesn't stick, you can try it. But this one is basically no bueno for uh, induction. Yeah, yeah, and I'm sure as, as we'll go along, if the, as they become more common, that they'll start to make more varieties of the induction. You know, uh, what's the word I want? Induction friendly uh, pots. You know, by adding enough iron or whatever into the mix etc so so that, that that they'll they'll be coming um Joel so so what's what's your number 3 um um yeah number 3 my number 3 tool is uh so I'm going to share my screen here and it's community solar so uh everyone's probably familiar with the idea of putting solar panels on your roof but if you're a renter uh, you don't have a roof that you have access to install stuff on. So when I moved to Maryland, we have community solar and I signed up with this company called Neighborhood Sun. And, uh, but if I, if I switch to the next one, there's actually around 20 states that have uh, community solar enabling legislation, they say. And, um, you know, you uh, we could put this in the show notes. You know, Solar United Neighbors is an organization. They have uh, a few states and will help you find solar in those states. And then uh, uh, Energy Sage, which is a, a website that lets you get solar quotes and find out if you were a homeowner wanted to install solar. Very good way to find out what your rooftop's potential is and to get a couple of quotes. But they also have a community solar page. You type in your zip code and you can find some projects. But it's, the thing about... So, so I don't really quite understand what community solar is. I mean, I understand there could be you know, a solar farm somewhere. And so... What makes it community solar versus just a solar farm? Great question. Um, so solar farms that are owned by you know utilities are essentially just part of their power mix. Community solar is a solar field that has been built and essentially either the developer or another company sells a subscription to part of that uh, solar farm. And so what happened when I moved here is I said, all right, my electric use is around 6,000 kilowatt hours a year. Mm -hmm. And so they signed me up for, I believe, 80% of that, right? So around plus or minus 5,000 kilowatt hours a year. And then over the course of the year, as the solar is produced, they pay, part, they pay my bill for the credit that I get from what is produced at that farm. And then they bill me separately uh, at a 10% discount to what they paid the utility. So I'm paying for a, they pay for part of my bill and I pay them at a reduced cost. Sure. And when, and the business model is that when they pay off the solar panels, uh, then everything that they generate is profit. And the way that the developers can make money is that they, uh, there's essentially a, a financialized instrument, uh, if you will, like a Wall Street type thing called a renewable energy credit, mm -hmm. and they can sell that on the open market mm -hmm. for the carbon reduction. So essentially, I'm buying the the power that the thing produces, 
even though it's not directly those electrons right. coming to my house, it's credited in the wider market. Right. And then the developer's making money by selling the carbon credits, right. essentially, from that solar farm. And are, is there any direct benefit to the consumer? To or, I mean, it's like, is it cheaper electricity? Um, other than it's green, which I can understand is sort of a intangible, but is there any economic benefit to you as a consumer to go with a community solar? Yeah, there is. Uh, and, and that is that I pay 90, uh, I get a 10% discount on that 5,000 kilowatt hours I'm buying every year. So um, th it basically just works out that because they're paying part of my bill and I'm paying them less than what they're paying, I end up ahead okay. 10%. Right. And uh, But in addition to that, it is trying to like, Part of part of the thing about electrify everything is just to be clear if you get rid of all the fossil gas or fossil infrastructure in your house whether it's delivered fuel oil or whatever uh and you run it on electricity in just about everywhere in the country even running it on pretty dirty electricity the appliances use so much less energy that even if it's dirty electricity produced at a fossil fuel power plant it's still a benefit from a from a climate point of view and then as the grid greens, uh, it will your your the stuff you're running will just get cleaner and cleaner. Sure. So that's right now, it, it's a it's a benefit. But the further benefit is if you want to accelerate that something like community solar or something like your uh, utilities green energy plan can help promote uh, your electricity mix getting greener faster because you're pushing your dollars towards the renewable options. Yep. And in the case of community solar, because it's developers building new power, essentially new solar farms to supply the demand, uh, you're helping to expand the solar access uh, in your region. Right. Okay. That's, that's good. So if you are, whether you have these additional new cool tools of a heat pump and induction stove, if you want to save 10%, of your electrical bill, you may want to look at community solar as an option. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, this again, if you if you don't have community solar in your area, uh, it can still pay, it might be a little bit more, it might be a little bit less uh, to switch your existing utility bill to their 100% clean energy right. plan. Right. Many, many right. utilities have that with the same idea of like, well, if I'm going all electric, or even if you're not going all electric, this is an easy thing to do right off the sure. bat just sure. to try and sure encourage uh renewables okay so joel your fourth tool so yeah okay my fourth tool i'm going to divert slightly from electrify everything to uh, a website that i just love and it's called bookfinder.com uh i buy a lot of used books um and bookfinder is essentially a meta used book site and so you type in the title or the isbn and it will find all of the copies all over the world and sort them by uh, low to high price. And so sometimes if I'm looking for an obscure used book, there might be only one or two copies available. For many books, there are many copies available and you can find like a very good or like new copy for essentially $4 shipped. But I will go one step further with BookFinder and say that uh, uh, I am a big fan of the Whole Earth uh, catalog. Uh, I have uh, here a, a, a <laughs> essential whole earth right, catalog that right, I got for right. I got for ten bucks, and so one of the things I've liked I've been doing recently is um, you can go on the Internet Archive. Bob Horvath has a uh, it has an archive page that has lots of whole earth uh, mm -hmm. um, references. Right, you can go and so like this book is on the Internet Archive. Right. It's archive.org. Right. You can look through uh, the old whole earth catalogs. Find books that are interesting to you. Uh, many of those are also scanned and on the Internet Archive, That's and you true. can borrow them That's for an hour. True. That's true. And if you can't find the book that you're looking for from, you know, the yeah. 1971 version of the Whole Earth Catalog, you can probably find a copy using bookfinder.com. Yeah, yeah. So I, it's been a while since I went to Abe Books. I used to use Abe Books as to yep. I use books. That was sort of the same general idea of this kind of aggregation of lots of other bookstores that give you a kind of a unified interface to it. I think they might have been bought by Amazon. I'm not really sure because all of a sudden Amazon had a pretty good selection of used copies as well. So tell me the differences between Abe Books, Bookfinder, and Amazon. 
Sure. So Bookfinder, I'm not exactly sure what the business model is, whether they get money from the you know traffic that yeah, is sent yeah. to these used book sites. But essentially, if you search for a book, it will come up with, it'll search a books, it'll search a Libris, mm -hmm. it'll search uh, Amazon, okay. it'll search eBay, and it will, you know, Biblio, all these used book sites. And it will, for the book you're looking for, list all the copies not just uh, from a books, but also here's the one from Amazon. Right, here's right, the one right, from right. Libris, and list them in increasing price order. Okay. So that's why I say like, often you'll see a book that's, you know, like this whole, essential whole earth catalog, you know, it has maintained its value as a reference, uh, but there are a lot of copies of it because this is one of the relatively newer ones. And so I got this copy for 10 bucks, but there are people who kind of, are using the lack of awareness of the market to sell it for a hundred or 200 bucks right. as a collector's item, which don't get me wrong. It is, right. but by using book finder again, like for commodity books, uh -huh. it can be four bucks for a you for obscure books. It right. can be, you know, only one or two copies. And even then if one copy might be 10 bucks, the other copy might be a hundred bucks. Okay. So um, do you have any sense of the, say the comparison say to just Amazon, because I'm such a lazy person that yeah. go to Amazon for everything. And I know that, you know, sometimes they're even prime and I don't have to think about it and I can trust it. So I tend to go with, if Amazon has used books, I tend to go with that option. And they often have, you know, no rank in, in price as well. Price, including the shipping price, which is really crucial. Um, so do you have a compare, do you have any, uh, any sense? It's like, okay, so if the book finder finds it on Amazon, then that, does it take you then to the Amazon page? So you can order yeah. it there? Okay, yeah, yeah. I see. All right. All right. So it's so so you're still if you still want to use Amazon, you can still get Amazon through Bookfinder. All right, that's brilliant. Okay, that's really brilliant. Yeah. I got it. Yeah, and the, just a last plug for uh for whole earth back issues <laughs> is uh I find myself, you know, as I age, uh, uh -huh. looking at looking back at them and finding things that I wasn't interested in before or and so like those kind of it pays to revisit those curated catalogs yes. from your, and not only that, um, uh, I find things that I didn't, I wasn't interested in before things that I missed. And, uh, it's, it's just a, a great way to like, it, the other thing is that none of those books or a lot of those books from like the sixties and seventies and even the eighties are not reviewed on Amazon. So you guys did the work of recommending all these books but they don't have, you know, 5,000 four-star reviews. It's like <laughs> one star if somebody bothered to review it. So you can find essentially, you know, Stuart Brand, Kevin Kelly, five-star reviews that nobody knows about on Amazon. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Like they're, they're kind of forgotten. Um, um, and some of them are still, you know, are still viable, but a, a lot of it has been eclipsed. I mean, I have a two-story bookshelf here with a lot of those books that were from the whole earth catalog. Um, and they do have it, but, but generally used books are so inexpensive. I, I talk about, I think we're at peak book right now. We're at peak book in the sense that you can get books for so cheap. And I don't think that's going to be true because we're going to stop making a lot of these books. Okay. And so like, in, you know, 50 years from now, there's not going to be that many new books printed on paper. And so um, the prices will probably go up. So this is like, this is like the ideal time to buy it because like there's never been as cheap and they're very available and they probably won't be as available in, in the future. So um, yeah. So if you're, if you like books, this is a, this is really the golden age for, for them. And book finder sounds like the, the uh, perfect one. It reminds me of this other website called just watch. Do people know about just watch? Just watch is where you find out where something is streaming right now or or, or available. It's like put any movie, anything in it, it'll tell you, oh, yeah, you can get on Apple, you can get on Netflix, you can get on Hulu, but it tells you where because I can never figure out like where. I know I'm sure this is streaming somewhere, but where? Well, Just Watch is the website that kind of deals like Bookfinder. It's going to tell you where it is and how much it costs if, it, if it's for sale. And, how, and so it's just really perfect. So this is kind of like the Bookfinder version for books, which is fabulous. So, Joel, um, thank you. That's really great. I love that. Tell us about um, something that you want to promote or share with our audience. Sure. So, oops. Uh, 
I just closed it. Hang on a second. Um, so again, I work for Rewiring America, and our goal is to help everybody electrify everything. Um, and it, a lot of it can pass through your house. And you know, I was sharing stuff today with uh, with renters, but again, useful for homeowners as well. And uh, I wrote I wrote this book in 2021, Electrify Everything in Your Home, which Kevin, you were very uh, generous in including in a recommendo uh, at the in December 2021. Uh, and this is available for free download, and it tries to get into what are the appliances that you need to upgrade, your heat pump, your gas stove, et cetera, uh, and what questions should you ask your contractor, and how do you make a plan? Um, but we wrote this before the Inflation Reduction Act passed, and since then, um, Rewiring America, if you go to rewiringamerica.org, uh, we promote this uh, Inflation Reduction Act Savings Calculator. So if you put in a little bit of personal information, which we don't do anything with, uh, it will give you a sense of how much money you could potentially save uh, both if you're income qualified, there's money available, just like upfront discounts that are going to be coming out at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. And if you're not income qualified, which is basically if you're not in the low and middle income uh, bracket, you're still eligible for uh, tax credits up to you know two thousand dollars off a heat pump or two thousand dollars off a heat pump water heater, um, seventy five hundred dollars off a new EV, etc. So you can go to this website and get information about what you might be eligible for. And then finally, we have this uh, um, Go Electric Guide to the Inflation Reduction Act. This is just has a couple of case studies and tries to help you plan out what the next ten years of the Inflation Reduction Act might look like for you to fully electrify. So 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 just in general um the the most likely places that you might qualify for some money from this um act is if you're buying something new that will electrify like whether it could be a car or heat pump or something else so some some purchase that you're making that you could be discounted it probably does not apply to anything you've already done or installed. Is that right? It's trying to incentivize new, new action. Um, and then if you look forward in 10 years, what in general is your suspicion or your hunch or your guidance about where things may be going? If you bought, if you bought a car after the inflation reduction act was passed last fall uh, in August, I believe it is retroactive to that. Okay. And there are IRS web pages you can look at around the car stuff. But I think everything else is forward looking. Uh, and the, the tax credit started on January 1st. So if you bought something in the last three months, uh, two and a half months, whatever, uh, that's electric, you might be eligible. OK. But as far as what it looks like in 10 years, I mean, I think that this idea is starting to go mainstream. Um, I know I looked at the comments from a previous uh, Cool Tools, and there's some climate skeptics in the Cool Tools commenting section. Uh, the thing is, even if you think that the climate is not a problem and it's not going to, and we don't have to get off fossil fuels. The fact is that these appliances are just better. Yeah. Like yeah. the fact that you can get an air conditioner that can also heat your room and not let you not have to turn right. on the gas, which has gotten quite expensive is pretty useful. Right. And the fact that uh, an induction burner doesn't produce asthma pollution in your kitchen is also useful. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so and, and electric cars are just, miles better than any gas powered car i mean it's, yeah, it's but, clear if you've the, ever driven one totally so evs are much better you know people like the performance but they also use you know four times yeah. less energy per mile right right and they require much less maintenance so it's just going to start taking off and as people electrify there are a number of benefits one is that you can stop paying uh fossil fuel companies mm -hmm. for their product which generally sends money out of the community. Mm -hmm. And so if you have local solar panels or even rooftop solar panels, then all that money stays within the community. Um, there's certain costs that you know you, we pay to let's say the fossil gas mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure to maintain that. And as people drop off of that system, it's gonna keep getting more and more expensive yeah, yeah. for the people who are still on the fossil gas system. And so our goal is that in 10 years, people have essentially said, hey, I'm going to take advantage of the money that's available to upgrade my stuff, and it really is an upgrade, to electric appliances. And the people who haven't done it are going to be, you know, the horse and buggy people. I don't have a problem. I, I've, lis I've listened to your books, and I understand, like, you know, the Amish are horse and buggy people by choice. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's going to become a thing where it's like, oh, is your house all electric? Oh, it's not. 
I'm not sure I want to rent it and I'm not sure I want to buy it. Right. And, and that's what we're trying to do is transform the market because for those of us who do think climate change is a problem, right. this is a urgent thing right, right, to do. Right, right. So there are, there are, there are some practical things. And I was inspired by your, your book, which is, a, you know, as I recommended was free, which is really amazing, which was how to electrify your house. But um, as we went to inspect our own setup and trying to do things like, we have a gas furnace, which I would love to turn into a heat pump, but it's like, it's kind of really far from any outside source. It needs an outside, it's like a, you know, the venting and the duct work and everything um, is f far from having an outside radiator, which is basically what you need. And so that, that, that prospect of how we would even engineer that, um, I'm not sure. Do you have suggestions about that? Sure. So if uh, I don't know when the last time you considered uh, replacing your furnace with a heat pump was, but the technology keeps getting better. Uh, there are now, you know, there are there, there are ductless versions of heat pumps. There are ones that are more ductless efficient and can be locally ducted. And so, um, well, you know, I would. So, 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 so the, you know, the, 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 it's, it's forced air. So it's forcing air that mm -hmm. that can't really be changed and that's the purpose is there's a it generates the heat right there so if it's taking the heat from outside it's going to move the heat from way down from outside and move it to somewhere where the blowers are and so i don't know what that looks like it's like you would have um i guess you'd have the refrigerant coils would have to be kind of moved so that they yeah, the, the very long coils that go all the way out. Anyway, so there's an engineering challenge to retrofitting as in any case. And it's not as simple. I mean, you're much better off if you're doing new construction, but the retrofitting is hairy and um, not as as uh, as obvious for us as just replacing the unit. You know, there's, there's so um, I welcome well, the, the new technologies that, that would enable that, but I haven't seen it yet. So I would I would encourage you I would encourage everybody you too Kevin uh to you know call some contractors have them come out yeah uh and and make some suggestions as to what could be possible in your home given the current technology now it's possible I I don't think that there are any houses that are really terrible candidates some are better than others mm. but I would just recommend you know generally get three quotes um ask a lot of questions. I put in the guide like yeah. questions to ask your contractor and see what they say. And it might be more possible than the last time you checked. And it might be more possible than you thought. And, the, you know, at some point, really like the large part of the guide of the home guide right. is to try and help you understand right. what you need to do and to get going on right. making a plan right. Right. because you're going to have to replace your furnace, right? It's And you're going to have to replace your water heater. And if you don't want to lock in another 20 years of fossil fuel yeah. buying, then if you can get the quotes now, while well, your stuff still works, then you know you can either do it ahead of time sure, before sure, it dies, sure. or you're in a position to do it when yeah, it does yeah, die. No, our water heater does need, it's right next to the furnace, so it's the same thing. So anybody who has, if you have central uh, cooling and AC, you're, 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 you're fine. But we we don't need air conditioning here where we live, so we don't have that, and so there is no central heating or um, I mean central cooling. So that's a little bit of a of a retrofit. But yes, you're you're, you're absolutely correct because we want to do both, both the water heater and the air heater at the same time with the same engine. Um, and we have radiant floor heating, which is another issue. But go ahead. So um, this is really great. Are you going to be updating your book? That was. You know, it was twenty one, twenty one. Yeah. So do you, do you have do you have a update version in uh, works? It's I have a couple of notes. Uh, we well, we're going to try and get an updated version. Hopefully, mid middle to late this year. Um, we're constantly putting out other stuff. We're trying to work on like community scale right. uh, electrification. We're we're just trying to move the ball. But the answer is uh, yes. I hope to update the guide sometime this year. It doesn't. Luckily, it doesn't require that much. Right, right. But it's probably more along the lines of like heat pumps and stuff, and what's changed there. But I'm sure the philosophy is probably pretty, pretty much the same. Yeah, I mean, one we didn't include a, a section on radiant floors and heat pumps for you know what's known as 
air, air to water heating, but uh, right. I'd probably put that into the next version and, and a couple of, you know, typos and whatever. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah. but so far the information holds up. So, yeah. and I'm happy to talk to you offline, Kevin, sure. about helping you. But it's, really, it's really great. Buy. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll look for some, because we do have to upgrade our water heater and um, this issue of, of ra radiating it um, is the, it's, it's complex to, to reach this place. Um, I mean, you know, we have gas line going in way deep into the house, but we don't have radiation way deep into the house. So, um, Joel, it's been really great. Thank you. What a mission. I appreciate it. Cool stuff. The things that you brought to our attention are things I say, said renters can use as well. So it's really wonderful. I appreciate it. And thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you for having me so much. And thanks for, you know, all of your work over the years. Big fan. And um, yeah, don't buy an air conditioner, everybody. <laughs> make a plan. Make a plan. To all right. buy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this year, our Cool Tools blog will be 20 years old, which means we've been posting something new every day for 20 years. It's only possible because of the very engaged and knowledgeable readers and listeners like yourself. You've kept this place going, and we are very grateful for you. With this idea of 20 years in mind, um, we decided to try an experiment this year, and I'm inviting our guests and listeners to join me on our Cool Tool Show and Tell, which is the program that you're listening to right now. So if you feel you'd make a good guest on this podcast, and have four uncommon tools that you'd like to share with us, um, please sign up on our form on the website, and we'll see about inviting you. You must be comfortable taking all, talking on a video, and um, you need to have some tools that you can show. Um, we record on, as you know, on Zoom. We do a YouTube version, a visual video version of it, as well as an audible version. Fill out the form if you're interested and um, list your four, four cool tools, and we'll see if there's a good fit. The applications aren't guaranteed in any way, um, and we're looking at tools that are new to us and appropriate tools and um, whether the times will work for you. So um, we're really interested in hearing from people all over the world, not just in the U.S., although the tools have to be available online, easily available online. And um, if you are a longtime listener, you kind of know what the definition of our tools are. They're very broad. They can be anything that's handy, from something in the kitchen to something used to travel to a workshop to something professional that we may not know about. We're really interested in things that we don't know anything about. So um, this is an open invitation. We'll give it a try. If you think you make a good guess for this podcast, um, fill out the form. There'll be a link somewhere on our website. Um, and we look forward to, to chatting with you. Thank you.